The UK has many political parties, and it's had thousands of candidates over the years. We've had a fish finger, for crying out loud. And therefore, with so many parties, so many candidates, so many people who are politically minded, and so many people who are furiously politically minded, it happens often. You can expect that there has been a great history of politics within the United Kingdom. And what we're going to do today is look at the history of some of the UK political parties. Now, we're not going to look through all of them, but we are going to look through all of those which are currently in Parliament. So sorry to UKIP, we're not covering UKIP here. Sorry to Reform, we're not covering Reform. It's probably some kind of conspiracy against the far-right parties, you might say. Well, it's not. It's just that they're not elected, and if they were, they'd be in this video. Okay, so deal with it, fam. Okay, so before we begin, please hit the subscribe button, and if you do, we promise you a lifelong commitment to video content. Good video content, too. Like, people really do like our content and it's very good to see. So we're going to keep making videos for you three times a week and every day. If you haven't noticed, we put up a on this day in history every single day without a break. Even the Lord's Day Sunday, we're still putting up these videos. So, okay, let's jump in and we're going to begin in chronological order and we're going to start with the Tory party slash the Conservative party. So here we go. The Conservative party, often colloquially referred to as the Tories, is one of the oldest and most prominent political parties, not just in the United Kingdom in the world. And their origins are in the 17th century. So the origins of the Conservative Party can be traced back to the late 17th century when political factions known as Tories emerged in opposition to the now defunct Whig Party. The term Tory itself is believed to derive from the Irish word Tora, and this means pursuer or outlaw. So the modern Conservative Party was officially founded in 1834, which merged various Tory and Conservative factions into the one party we know today. And the party has since been known by different names including the Conservative and the Unionist Party, reflecting its commitment to maintaining the union between England, Scotland, Ireland, and now Wales, or the then Wales was part of England. So, in the 19th century, the Conservative Party was led by prominent figures such as Benjamin Disraeli and Robert Peel, and both played a key role in British politics. Disraeli, in particular, implemented social and political reforms to address issues such as working conditions and public health. Disraeli is still considered by many in the Conservative Party today as something of an outcast because his politics were less in line with the Conservative Party Party even then, and more so now, perhaps. And in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was the Conservative Party navigating issues such as free trade and imperial expansion. Leaders like Joseph Chamberlain advocated for imperial preferences and closer ties within the British Empire. And then the Conservative Party faced the challenges during the interwar years, including economic difficulties and the aftermath of World War One. Stanley Baldwin, in particular, led the party and served as Prime Minister during this period. And then, of course, came the most transformative man in not just politics, but within the Conservative Party at this time, and that's Winston Churchill, and he was a prominent figure within the Conservative Party, and led the country during World War II as Prime Minister following the resignation of Neville Chamberlain. And then after the war, the Conservatives faced challenges in rebuilding the economy, and Churchill was succeeded by Clement Attlee's Labour government, simply because the Conservative Party was not seen as one at that time which was good at rebuilding the country after the war. It was seen as the War Party. Churchill especially was seen as a wartime leader, so that's why Labour won. In 1945, and then in the late 20th century, there was the rise of Margaret Thatcher, and she transformed the Conservative Party even more. Thatcher's leadership from 1979 to 1990 was characterized by conservative economic policies, deregulation, privatization, and a strong stance against trade unions. For American viewers watching, she is basically the female British version of Ronald Reagan. Like she was a proponent of Reaganomics, and this greatly influenced the Conservative Party, and it still is like this today. It's a free market party now. It's not really a conservative party in the traditional sense of the word. And this is because of Thatcher. And then John Major succeeded Thatcher as Prime Minister in 1990, and his tenure included managing economic challenges, such as negotiating the Maastricht Treaty, and facing internal divisions over European integration. And then, of course, the subject of Europe would dominate the Conservative Party, because originally the Conservative Party was pro-joining the European Union, but then, when we skipped the Blair years, when the Conservative Party was out of power for one of its longest periods, if not its longest, and it had to do some inner thinking. It came back with David Cameron, who was a pro-Europe leader. But by this point, there were so many in the party challenging this view, and they wanted to see Britain leave the European Union. And this brought in Boris Johnson, who became the Prime Minister in 2019, and led the Conservatives to a more populist, sort of Donald Trump type of politics, where he says rather vague things and then fails to act upon them, and gets 
gets himself into trouble with lots of scandal. So yeah, that is a very brief history of the Conservative Party. So let's move on to the Labour Party. The Labour Party is one of the major political parties in the United Kingdom, and it has historically been associated with representing the interests of the working class and Labour movement. So the Labour Representation Committee, or the LRC, was formed in 1900 as a political voice for the trade unions and Labour Representation League. It aimed to provide political representation for the working class, and its founder, Keir Hardy, was considered a champion of the working class himself. In the 1906 general election, the Labour Party won 29 seats, marking its emergence as a significant political force. The party was officially renamed the Labour Party in 1906 as a result. Ramsay MacDonald became the first Labour Prime Minister in 1924, and he led a minority government. However, his government only lasted nine months, and Labour's influence continued to grow, and in 1929, MacDonald led another government, this time as a head of a minority Labour administration, which he was much criticised for, for going into a deal with the Conservative Party, who was seen as the antithesis of the Labour Party, or the Labour movement as a whole. Clement Attlee became Prime Minister in 1945, and he led the majority Labour government. His government implemented significant social reforms, such as the creation of a National Health Service, or NHS, and the nationalisation of key industries. This was seen as a golden era of Labour history. And then in the swing in 60s, Howard Wilson led the Labour Party through much of the 1960s and 1970s. His government focused on modernisation and social reform. The 1960s are often referred to as the swing in 60s in the UK, and were characterised by cultural and social changes, many of them brought in by Harold Wilson and his Labour government. However, it's worth noting by this point that the Labour Party had sort of moved away from its working class roots, and whereas it still championed the working class to some extent, it was definitely different to the one first founded. And James Callaghan led the Labour Party and served as Prime Minister during a challenging period in the late 1970s. And the so-called winter of discontent in 78-79 was marked by widespread strikes and industrial unrest, which contributed to the decline of the Labour government, who, of course, should be championing these working class people who were striking, but instead were sort of challenging them. The Labour Party faced significant challenges during the 1980s, with the Conservative government under Margaret Thatcher implemented conservative economic policies. Neil Kinnock led Labour through this period, attempting to modernise the party, but he failed to secure a victory in each of his attempts at the general election. And in 1992, the Labour Party, which was widely expected to win, lost again, which led to a period of reflection, which eventually ushered in new Labour led by Tony Blair. And under the leadership of Tony Blair, the Labour Party underwent a process of modernisation and rebranding, and was of course called New Labour. Blair led the party to victory in the 1997 general election, which ended 18 years of Conservative rule and gave the Labour Party a significantly historic majority in the House of Parliament. The new Labour government focused on economic stability, social reforms and constitutional changes. And whereas it did many great things for the working people of Britain, such as a minimum wage and lower waiting times in the NHS, it is often often viewed as a more Tory in nature version of the Labour Party, some distance away from the original Labour Party. Gordon Brown, who was the Chancellor under Tony Blair and was widely seen to be the next Labour Prime Minister in the 1990s before Tony Blair managed to somehow succeed him. Gordon Brown succeeded Tony Blair's PM in 2007 and his premiership faced challenges including the global financial crisis of 2008 and in the 2010 general election Labour failed to win a majority which led to a coalition government between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. And then this again led to another period of reflection for Labour, and it went towards the soft left between 2010 and 2015 with the leadership of Ed Miliband, but then went to a more radical leftist in Jeremy Corbyn, who became the leader of the Labour Party in 2015 and led the party in a more left-wing direction. However, his leadership faced internal divisions and criticism from many, and in the 2019 general election, Labour suffered a significant defeat and Corbyn had to step down as leader, which then ushered in a new period of reflection and led to the leadership of the current leader, Keir Starmer, who presented himself more as a Corbyn-type leader during his initial leadership election, but has since drifted to the right and has become something more resembling Blair than Corbyn. In fact, Corbyn is still exiled from the party to this day, which further reflects the inner conflict within the Labour Party today between the left and the right, and the once broad church, as it was once referred, is now broken into a number of different factions. And then we move on to Sinn Féin, and do remember that we're doing this in chronological order. So, Sinn Féin was founded in 1905 by Arthur Griffith with the aim of establishing an Irish Republic. Initially, the party focused on promoting Irish culture and economic self-sufficiency within the United Kingdom. The Easter Rising of 1916 was a rebellion against British rule in Ireland and played a crucial role in shaping the trajectory of Sinn Féin. Leaders of the Rising, many of whom were members of the Irish Volunteers, proclaimed an Irish Republic. In the aftermath,
aftermath, Sinn Féin gained popularity as a political force. Sinn Féin became the political wing of the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA, during the War of Independence between 1919 and 1921. The party boycotted the British Parliament and established the first Dale Éireann in Irish Parliament in 1919. The Anglo-Irish Treaty, signed in 1921, led to a split within Sinn Féin over the terms of the treaty. The signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty led to the Irish Civil War between 1922 and 1923, and between pro-treaty forces supporting the treaty and anti-treaty forces who opposed the treaty. Sinn Féin split into two factions, those who supported the treaty leading to the formation of Cumann na Nail, and those who opposed it maintaining the name Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin, under the leadership of Eamon de Valera, adopted a policy of abstentionism from the Free State Parliament and later the Republic of Ireland's Parliament, due to its rejection of the legitimacy of these institutions. The party remained on the fringes of Irish politics for much of this period, and in the late 1960s, tensions in Northern Ireland escalated, leading to the Troubles, a period of conflict between the nationalist and unionist communities. Sinn Féin, under the leadership of Gerry Adams, became associated with the Republican movement and the political wing of the Provisional Irish Republican Army, or the IRA. The party faced controversy due to alleged IRA involvement in violence, although this has never been truly proven. Sinn Féin played a significant role in the Northern Ireland peace process during the 1990s, and the Good Friday Agreement, or the Belfast Agreement, was signed in 1998, leading to power-sharing arrangements in Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin became a key player in the political institutions established by the agreement. Sinn Féin experienced electoral growth both in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland in the following years, and the party became a major force in Northern Ireland politics, participating in the devolved government. In the Republic of Ireland, Sinn Féin gained popularity as an alternative to traditional political parties. Sinn Féin continued to be a prominent political force, with Mary Lou Macdonald succeeding Gerry Adams as party leader in 2018. The party's stance on issues like Brexit and Irish reunification remained central to its political platform. In the 2020 general election in the Republic of Ireland, Sinn Féin achieved significant success, winning the most first preference votes. This marked a significant shift in Irish politics, challenging the dominance of the traditional political parties. And once more, it influenced the 2022 National Assembly election in Northern Ireland, which led to Sinn Féin winning there too, meaning that for the first time Sinn Féin is in power within both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, meaning that reunification may just be closer than ever before. Yeah. That's Plaid Cymru. So Plaid Cymru was founded in 1925 and its current leader is Hrun Ap Jorwef. So let's begin. So for those of you who don't Sharad Cymru, that means speak Welsh, Plaid Cymru means the party of Wales and is a political party in Wales that advocates for Welsh independence and the promotion of Welsh culture and identity. So Plaid Cymru was founded on August the 5th, 1925 in Pocahelly, North Wales. Its establishment was influenced by the desire to promote Welsh nationalism and address concerns about the erosion of Welsh language and culture. Of course, this was a different time in British and Welsh history. Wales was still considered as part of England. There were attempts to suppress the Welsh language, such as the Welsh not, which was still, contrary to popular belief, still in use at this time. And therefore, the formation of Plaid Cymru was a relatively straightforward formation to make. And in the early years, Plaid Cymru focused on cultural issues and autonomy for Wales within the United Kingdom. Gwynford Evans, one of the party's prominent early leaders, played a crucial role in shaping its direction, which was considered as more of a centre-left or left-wing direction, I guess. And then in the post-war period and their political engagement, so Plaid Cymru became more politically active in the post-war period. The party contested its first parliamentary election in 1951, but did not win any seats until 1966, when Gwynford Evans was elected as the Member of Parliament for Carmarthen. If you're wondering why they were suddenly elected in 1966, well, you need to think about a certain event which happened in 1965, and you can think of Capel Kellen, which was the Welsh village which was flooded to make water for Liverpool. So, yes, this was partly the reason for Plaid Cymru's growth at the time. And then in the 1970s, Plaid Cymru actively campaigned for the establishment of a devolved Welsh Assembly. Many in Plaid Cymru, same as with the Scottish National Party and way earlier Sinn Féin, Plaid Cymru believed that devolution was the natural progression towards ultimate independence from the United Kingdom. And in 1979 devolution referendum, although a majority of voters supported devolution, it failed to meet the 40% threshold required for implementation. Then in 1980, Gwynford Evans protests came. Gwynford Evans undertook a hunger strike in 1980 to protest against the Thatcher government's decision not to establish a Welsh national language television channel. And this contributed to a change in policy. And S4C, a Welsh language channel, was eventually established. It's still on TV today, and it's still a Welsh language channel. The only one, in fact. Then in 1997, devolution took place. So the devolution referendum marked a turning point. The Welsh people voted in favour of devolution, leading to the establishment of the National Assembly for Wales in 1999, or the Senef. Plaid Cymru played a significant role in shaping the devolved government, and it has been in power on numerous occasions as part of the minority party in a minority government alongside Labour, which has won every single election, though not always with a majority. Plaid Cymru underwent leadership changes 
years in the 2000s, and under leaders such as Ewan Wynne Jones and later Leanne Wood, the party continued to focus on Welsh independence, and issues such as economic development, education, and healthcare. It has also moved more in a left wing direction during this time, and is considered less of a centre left party and more of a socialist party. Plaid Cymru has been a major player in Welsh politics in recent years, and especially in the context of devolved elections. In the 2016 National Assembly for Wales election, Plaid Cymru became the second largest party in terms of seats. Whereas the Conservatives have grown since then and reclaimed their number two position, Plaid Cymru remain a force within the National Assembly election and are a considerable threat to both Labour and the Tories as they have a unifying factor of Welsh independence. And this seems to unite people on the right and the left who would respectively vote for the Tories and Labour. And then in 2023, Plaid Cymru gained run at Pioro FS leader. And since then, the party is going through something of a reflection period following the leadership of Adam Price. So the future looks bright for Plaid Cymru and we can only see what happens next. And next we visit the Scottish sister party of Plaid Cymru and that's the Scottish National Party or the SNP. So here's a brief history of the SNP. The SNP was founded in 1934 with the merger of the National Party of Scotland and the Scottish Party. The party aimed to represent the interests of Scotland and to pursue Scottish self-government. Again, much like Plaid Cymru and Sinn Féin before it. So early years and World War II, the SNP had a relatively small impact during its early years and its activities were limited. The outbreak of World War II disrupted political activities, but the SNP continued to exist and advocate for Scottish interest. And then in the post-war period, the SNP gained increased visibility. The party contested elections and started to gain support, particularly in by-elections. Winnie Ewing won the Hamilton by-election in 1967, marking a significant breakthrough for the SNP. However, Scotland was traditionally a Labour stronghold, and this was a serious problem for the SNP at the time, because much like Labour, the SNP was a left-wing party, or at least a centre-left party. The SNP played a crucial role in the call for the Scottish Parliament, and in the 1979 devolution referendum, although the majority of voters supported devolution, it did not meet the threshold set by the UK government for implementation. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Again, the SNP has a very similar history to Plaid Cymru, and they are sister parties to this day. The 1980s then saw the SNP opposed to the policies of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and the party gained support as a result. The 1987 general election saw the SNP winning a significant number of seats in the House of Commons, and this was the first period of growth for the SNP. And with Labour moving towards a more centre-right direction at this time, this was a strong case for the SNP to continue growing, which they did. And then the turning point for the SNP came with the establishment of the Scottish Parliament in 1999. Following a successful devolution referendum in 97, the SNP formed the first Scottish executive with the support of the Liberal Democrats. Alex Salmond became the leader of the SNP in 1990, and he played a crucial role in transforming the party. Throughout the 2000s especially, the party continued to grow under his leadership, and he was considered a powerhouse of Scottish politics. And the SNP became the majority party in the Scottish Parliament in the 2007 elections, forming the first SNP-led government. Again, Alex Salmond was always in the news at this time. I remember him very, very prominently. And yeah, he kind of led the rise of the SNP during this period. Then in 2014, the SNP-led Scottish government held a referendum on Scottish independence. The No campaign prevailed with 55% of voters choosing to remain in the United Kingdom. Of course, this would spell the end of Alex Salmond's leadership as the SNP leader, and he would stand down, which would pave the way for Nicola Sturgeon, who was undoubtedly the SNP's most successful leader, and she only stepped down this year. The United Kingdom's decision to leave the European Union because of Brexit led to renewed calls for Scottish independence, because of course, Scotland voted overwhelmingly in favour of remaining within the European Union, and the SNP under the leadership of Nicola Sturgeon continued to advocate for independence, citing the desire of the Scottish people to remain within the European Union. Then in the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, the SNP secured a fourth consecutive term in government, and Nicola Sturgeon continued as the First Minister of Scotland until personal scandal interfered in 2023, and she stepped down to be replaced by Hamza Youssef, who is the current leader of the Scottish National Party. And even though the SNP remains the predominant force of political power within Scotland, its grasp on Scotland looks to be loosening as Labour is regularly ahead in the polls these days. Perhaps not regularly, but at least a little bit. And it's cause for concern for the SNP, so it should be interesting to see what happens next. Remember that we're continuing in chronological order, and next we have the Social Democratic and Labour Party, or the SDLP, which is a political party in Northern Ireland that was formed to advocate for civil rights, social democracy, and a non-violent approach to the resolution of the troubles. So, the SDLP was founded in 1970 by a group of politicians and civil rights activists, including Jerry Fitz, Austin Curry, and John Hume. The party aimed to provide a nationalist a non-violent alternative to the more radical and militant approaches taken by other groups, such as Sinn Féin, during the Troubles. The formation of the SDLP occurred against the backdrop of the civil rights
rights movement in Northern Ireland, which sought to address issues such as discrimination against Catholics in areas like housing and employment. The party initially focused on civil rights issues and non-violent protest. Then the Sunningdale Agreement of 1973, the SDLP played a role in the Sunningdale Agreement, a power-sharing arrangement that aimed to address the political situation within Northern Ireland. The agreement collapsed in 1974 due to opposition from some unionist groups and paramilitary violence. John Hume, one of the party's founders, became the leader of the SDLP in 1979, and Hume was instrumental in promoting dialogue and cooperation between nationalist and unionist communities, and he played a key role in the peace process. The SDLP was actively involved in negotiation and promotion of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. The agreement established a devolved government for Northern Ireland and outlined a framework for power sharing between unionists and nationalists. Then following the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, the SDLP participated in the devolved government of Northern Ireland. Leaders such as John Hume and later Mark Durkin served as Deputy First Minister and Minister for Finance. Then in the 2000s, the SDLP experienced a decline in electoral support, facing competition from other nationalist parties, particularly Sinn Féin, who had become less radical, at least in comparison to their former identity. The party struggled to maintain its previous levels of influence and has been on the wane since. The SDLP underwent leadership changes in the 2010s. Alistair MacDonald served as leader from 2011 to 2015 and was then followed by Colm Eastwood, who took over the leadership role. The SDLP experienced a resurgence in the 2019 European Parliament election with leader of Colm Eastwood winning a seat. In the 2022 Northern Ireland Assembly election, the SDLP increased its seat count, positioning itself as a significant player in the political landscape. So even though it's been on the wane in the past, it does look to be going through some kind of resurgence. So here's hoping the SDLP can bounce back. The Alliance Party of Northern Ireland. So the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland is a centre to centre left, liberal, non-sectarianist, pro-European political party within Northern Ireland. And it's currently led by Naomi Long. It has one seat in Westminster. So the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland was founded in 1970 with the aim of promoting non-sectarian politics and bridging the gap between the Catholic, Nationalist and Protestant Unionist communities in Northern Ireland, which of course there was a big divide between Catholics and Protestants then, kind of still there today, maybe not to the same extent, but who am I to comment on this? I'm a Welshman. The party emerged in a highly polarised political landscape during the Troubles, a period of ethno-nationalist conflict and violence in Northern Ireland that lasted from the late 1960s to the 1990s. The Alliance Party was founded on April 21st, 1970 by a group of individuals from various backgrounds who saw an alternative to the polarised politics dominated by the Unionist and Nationalist parties. During the early years of its existence, the Alliance Party advocated for non-sectarianism, integration, and power sharing between the Unionist and Nationalist communities. In 1973, the Sunningdale Agreement was reached, which established a power sharing executive in Northern Ireland. Alliance Party leader at the time, Oliver Napius, served as a member of the executive. The power sharing executive collapsed in 1974 due to opposition from within the Unionist community, and this marked a challenging period for the Alliance Party as it struggled to maintain political relevance. The party faced internal divisions and a decline in electoral support during the 1980s. But the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 marked a significant turning point for Northern Ireland. The Alliance Party played a role in the negotiations leading up to the agreement, as most parties in Northern Ireland did. The Good Friday Agreement established a devolved government with power-sharing arrangements, and the Alliance Party has continued to support this framework. The Alliance Party has maintained a commitment to non-sectarian politics and has been involved in the devolved institutions established by the Good Friday Agreement, including the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Executive. The party has had periods of electoral success with members holding ministerial positions in the devolved government. And the Alliance Party has been vocal on issues relating to Brexit and its impact on Northern Ireland. It has positioned itself as a pro-European and pro-agreement party, and the party has continued to work towards fostering a shared future for all communities in Northern Ireland. So while it's faced challenges in navigating the deeply divided political landscape of Northern Ireland, its commitment to non-sectarian principles and efforts to bridge the gap between communities has positioned it as a unique player in the region's politics. And in some ways, you know, it's kind of like the Northern Irish Liberal Democrats Party. The Lib Dems we still have to get to, and we're hoping to in this video, by the way. I can't wait. We love the Liberal Democrats here at Collective Histories. I promise you. Okay, so next we move on to the Democratic Unionist Party, also known as the DUP, which was founded in 1971. It is characterized as a right-wing British Unionist, British Nationalist, right-wing populist, and Eurosceptic party, and is currently led by a man named Jeffrey Donaldson. So uh, let's dive right into this party. So the DUP, again, was founded in 1971, and it's considered to be one of the, if not the, most successful party in Northern Irish politics. The party has been closely associated with Protestant and Unionist causes, and has played a significant role in shaping Northern Ireland's political landscape. It was founded by Ian Paisley in 1971, a prominent 
Parliament, Protestant clergyman and politician. The party was established in response to what Paisley perceived as insufficient staunch unionist positions taken by the traditional Ulster Unionist Party, which was the UUP. In its early years, the DUP opposed power sharing arrangements with nationalist parties and expressed strong opposition to any form of Irish unification. Ian Paisley was known for his fiery rhetoric and staunch defence of Protestant and Unionist interests. The St Andrews Agreement of 2006 paved the way for the restoration of devolved government in Northern Ireland. The DUP, then under the leadership of Paisley, agreed to share power with Sinn Féin. In 2007, Paisley became the first Minister of Northern Ireland, with Martin McGuinness of Sinn Féin serving as Deputy First Minister, which marked a significant development in the peace process. However, Paisley stepped down as DUP leader and First Minister in 2008. Peter Robinson succeeded him as party leader and First Minister. The party continues to be a major force in Northern Irish politics, advocating for unionist interests within the devolved institutions. The DUP played a key role in British politics when it entered into a confidence and supply agreement, essentially a coalition, with the Conservative Party after the woeful 2017 general election, and I mean woeful for then Prime Minister Theresa May. Jeez, remember her? This arrangement provided support to the Conservative government on key votes. Brexit became a contentious issue, and the DUP opposed elements of the withdrawal agreement, particularly the Northern Ireland Protocol, which aimed to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. It should be noted that Arlene Foster was then the leader, and Arlene Foster was taking a... I mean, she was more extreme than Paisley, in many ways. I, I'm not a big fan of the DUP, I can't pretend that I like them. And, uh, yeah, didn't like them, especially during this period, because it was they reached a point where they affected the rest of us, too, not just Northern Ireland. Arlene Foster succeeded Peter Robinson as the leader of the DUP and became the first minister of Northern Ireland in 2016. The party faced challenges, including internal disagreements and shifts in public opinion. The implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol post-Brexit created tensions, and the DUP continued to voice concerns about its impact on trade and unionist identity. The party faced electoral challenges, and its influence in Westminster diminished after the 2019 general election, and now its influence has diminished even further within Northern Ireland, as Sinn Féin has become the most popular party in the region. And it's very good to see. But I didn't say that because this is completely unbiased. Anyway, the DUP has been a significant player in Northern Irish politics, representing the unionist community and shaping the course of devolved government. Its history is marked by a commitment to maintaining Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom and advocating for the interests of the Protestant unionist population. Okay, next we have the Liberal Democrats. Nick Clegg, I want to fight you. Where are you, man? So though sharing the name Liberal Party with the old Liberal Party, that old electoral force within the United Kingdom, which no longer exists. Well, the Liberal Democrats is a different party, which evolved from it. So the Liberal Democrats, often referred to as the Lib Dems, is a centrist political party within the United Kingdom. It formed in 1988 through the merger of the old Liberal Party and the Social Democratic Party, or the SDP. And the Lib Dems have played a role in British politics ever since, particularly in advocating for civil liberties, social justice, and constitutional reform. They are often seen as centre to centre left also centre-right, they are liberal, social liberal, and they are very pro-European, and currently led by Ed Davey. So the Lib Dems were officially formed on March 3rd, 1988, through the merger of the Lib Dems and Social Democratic Party. The merger aimed to create a more effective centrist alternative to the two major parties, which, of course, were and are the Conservative and Labour parties. The early years of the Lib Dems were marked by leadership changes and efforts to establish the party as a credible political force. Paddy Ashdown became the party's first leader, leading it through the 1990s general election. But their big success would come in the 2010 general election. The Lib Dems, then led by Nick Clegg, entered into a coalition government with the Conservative Party. This marked the first coalition government in the UK since World War II. Would you believe it? There was lots before that, and yeah, that's an interesting step. The coalition government faced challenges, particularly regarding tuition fees. Nick Clegg, again, we're looking at you. And other policy differences leading to a decline in the party's popularity. The Lib Dems have been strong advocates for constitutional reform, including electoral reform, devolution, and changes to the House of Lords. The party has also emphasized civil liberties, human rights, and environmental issues in its policy agenda. After the 2015 general election, which the party experienced a significant reduction in seats as a result of the five-year coalition government, which did a lot to damage their liberal reputation, might I add. Tim Farron became the leader of the Liberal Democrats. And after 2017, the general election and Vince Cable, or Sir Vince Cable, if you are that way inclined, succeeded Tim Farron as leader in 2017. And then Joe Swinson took over the leadership in 2019. And that didn't last long because she was unseated in the 2019 general election. The Lib Dems took a clear anti-Brexit stance 
stance during the 2019 general election, advocating for a second referendum on the UK's membership within the European Union. And despite not achieving a significant breakthrough in terms of seats, the party saw an increase in its vote share because they had positioned themselves as a pro-second referendum party, whereas the Labour Party was very uncertain on what it wanted to be and the Conservative Party was devout as a Brexit party. So they did well to take votes from Labour in this election. But not for Joe Swinson, who lost a seat. Rather funny. The Lib Dems continued to focus on issues such as climate change, social justice, and constitutional reforms. The party has positioned itself as a pro-European and centrist alternative in British politics, and under the leadership of Ed Davey, it's trying to act as a more radical liberal party, because the Labour Party has kind of gone in a more right-wing, less radical direction post-Jeremy Corbyn, and the Conservatives are even more conservative and populist than ever, so the Lib Dems are trying to position themselves as the radical alternative to these two. Throughout its history, the Lib Dems have been characterized by their commitment to liberalism, social democracy, and an emphasis on civil liberties. The party has played a role in shaping political debates and policies, especially in areas related to constitutional reform and social issues. They continue to be one of the biggest parties within the United Kingdom. Okay, we only have two parties left within Westminster to cover, and we are running out of time, so I'm just going to quickly tell you who they are, I guess. So, we have the Green Party of England and Wales, which was founded in 1990, is positioned as a left-wing climate activist party. Its main priorities are green politics, progressivism, and pro-Europeanism, and it's currently led by Carla Denyer and Adrian Ramsey, who serve as co-leaders. It had a great period of growth in the 2015 general election, and it was very unfortunate to only have one seat, still held today by Caroline Lucas. And yeah, it's it's a good party. I quite enjoy the Green Party. Maybe one day we'll do a more in-depth video on them. And then we have the Elba Party, which is the newest party, and it was founded in 2021 as an alternative to the SNP. It was kind of founded over factionalism and Alex Salmond, the former SMP powerhouse, kind of had a fallout with Nicola Sturgeon essentially and he threw a tantrum and he founded the Elba Party, which is also a Scottish nationalist and Scottish independence party and I don't know why it exists. It's pretty much exactly the same as the SMP. so he only did this, in my opinion, to spite his former party and Nicola Sturgeon. So, yeah, that concludes the series. We finally made it. Oh my god, it took weeks. So, we look forward to bringing you more content in the future. We'll be continuing with the Lost Civilization series soon. I quite enjoy making that one. Please subscribe. See, I did it again. Very quick. Please subscribe. And then, if you want to do more, you can follow us on facebook.com forward slash collective histories page and on Instagram at instagram.com forward slash the collective histories and on Twitter slash x at twitter.com forward slash collective Histo and you can buy me a coffee if you are that kind and i'll be very grateful that's buymeacoffee.com forward slash collective history so that's everything we'll be back later in the week for our next video and remember we do videos every day daily content daily content we have on this day in history content every single day so please check them out too okay we'll be back very soon we wish you the best and yeah just watch out for nick clegg i guess okay goodbye <laughs>